I'm Gold Derby editor Daniel Montgomery here with John Wells, uh, an executive producer and director of Netflix's Made, which tells the story of the title character's struggle to make ends meet uh, after leaving an abusive relationship. Uh, it's adapted from a memoir by Stephanie Land. Uh, how did you first come across the book? Oh, you know, we were very fortunate. We got the book early in a manuscript. Aaron Juntal, who I work with, uh, had received it and uh, and we expressed a lot of interest with Stephanie in doing it. And then uh, the people at Lucky Chap, uh, Margot Robbie and Tom Ackerley were also interested and we're all at Warner Brothers. So we uh, we combined our forces and, uh, and were able to get the book. Um, so yeah, it worked out really well. And uh, what made you, uh, you know, want to bring on, you know, Molly Smith Metzler uh, to write and show run it? Like you'd worked with her on on Shameless. What made her the right fit for this material? You know, um, Molly is an extraordinary uh, playwright and uh, wonderful writer, uh, screenwriter, and we had been working together for a couple of years on Shameless, and <clears throat> we were literally in the next, you know, uh, in my, I'm in my office now, and the Shameless offices are just right over there. And Aaron said, "Let's give it to Molly." So we just walked over and gave her the book and said, Molly, you should uh, give it this some thought. And she came back, was interested in it. And we started talking and it was just the perfect fit. She just did an extraordinary job. Uh, and yeah, as the director of the first two episodes and of course also a producer, uh, what, what kind of tone did you wanna set for the show in terms of like the emotional tone, the you know, visual style, uh, what were the, those considerations? Well, the book itself, the original book, and then Molly's scripts are are very much we're com always in uh, in the lead character Alex's point of view. So, what we are really talking about is how to do it very naturalistically and how to um, make certain that the audience always remained uh, it inside of the experience that Alex was having with her child. So, um, you know, there's very little observational. We're not stepping back from things. We're in very uh, close with her a lot. Um, we, and we worked on a visual style with Q Tran, who was the cinematographer, um, and then later directed an episode, did a beautiful job directing one of the episodes, um, to make certain that we just felt the intimacy uh, of the relationship. So we'd really experience it all with Alex's character. So everything was about being in with her and what she saw. And, uh, you know, and Margaret uh, Qualley, who played Alex, just did a fantastic job. She's in every scene in the picture. Uh, you know, for uh, for 110 shooting days. So, uh, you know, we just wanted to stay in there and experience that with her, feel as if the audience was having the same experience that she was. Uh, and yeah, she's in every scene. Um, so that role is obviously, uh, you know, hugely important to the show. Um, you know, what was, what was that casting like? And I, I'd imagine the collaboration with her must have been very close given that, like you said, she's in every every scene. You know, we we uh, had to cast it the same way that we're doing this interview, which is all the casting happened over Zoom. So, um, you know, during the early parts of the pandemic. So we were, um, you know, working on it with her. Um, Molly and I met with a number of actresses and, and Margaret just shined through in her auditions with us and then her conversations. So we had a lot of conversations about the part. Her, she's not a mother, so her biggest concern going in was how would she create that bond with a child? so that it was believable. And, and then uh, she spent an extraordinary amount of time with Riley, the, uh, the young uh, girl who played uh, her daughter in the piece. Um, and, uh, you know, so we just talked a lot about the immediacy of it, about the feeling of it, about how she was going to, you know, only have so many clothes, you know, because we weren't gonna have a big closet for her of things because she's on the run from a relationship, how she was gonna struggle with it. And then we were very fortunate that Stephanie shared um, you know, was very open with us, the writer of the book, and talking about her experience and being prepared to talk to us about her experience, talk to Margaret, talk to Molly and to the writers and to, and to me and to the directors. So, uh, you know, she even took us to the places in the book so she could show us exactly where it was. So when we set out to set the world, um, you know, that experience that Molly and I had with, with Stephanie was really central to making sure that the actors were existing in the places that we'd now seen and really understood from the writing. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, Riley Neve Wittet, who plays uh, Maddie, uh, it's such a natural performance that of course, you know, you know, there's that adage of never working with children or animals that is dis that I think that's disproven more often than not. Um, you know, what, what, what was it like getting such a natural performance uh, out of an actor that young? Uh, who, yeah, you know, you, know, you such emotional stuff. 
you know, she um, she's a kid. She was three years old and four years old when we were doing it. A tremendous amount of that performance really comes from Margaret, uh, which was another one of the great things about Margaret in the sh in the and Margaret's performance in that she not only had to act her part, but also make certain that Riley uh, knew what the scene was supposed to be about and was doing what she was supposed to be. So I always said Margaret was acting uh, with, you know, two parts at the same time. And it was really just about Riley uh, making certain that Riley sort of generally understood the emotional tone of the scene and then constructing it directorially and, and in the performance that Margaret was doing. So we could actually uh, convince the audience that whatever mood Riley was in was actually the mood the character was supposed to be in because she was only three and four years old. So, you know, she's not acting. She's not really conscious of being able to act. She get, you know, we, we were very proud at the end that she got a couple of lines in, um, you know, uh, and actually learned the song that we sang at the end, which was one of sort of the great moments, uh, the Shoop song that she actually participated in, in the final two episodes. Um, but it was um, it was an experience of actually just getting close to this child and her parents and and getting uh, to where she trusted us and and we could, you know, put her into situations in which she understood that that she wasn't really threatened anyway or that the yelling wasn't really yelling and, you know. Uh, and yeah, you know, the show deals with some some heavy subject matter, but there, there are also there's also humor in it. Uh, what, what's it like walking that that line uh, where you, where you're telling this serious story, uh, but also not wanting to go down like medicine? You, you, you're telling a yeah. really lively, uh, you know, and life is full of comedy and tragedy. So there was a real intention, you know, uh, Molly and I talked about it early on, uh, we wanted to, uh, Molly came up with a wonderful term for it, which is knocking the NPR off of it, so that it didn't seem earnest. Um, when you're going through hard times, when you're struggling, uh, all, most people are really trying to find uh, humor, dark humor oftentimes, but humor in situations we are, uh, as people, um, we tend to be very optimistic and are always trying to find those things. And so Molly spent, and the writer spent a lot of time talking about making certain that she was buoyant, that she was trying, that she was striving, and that no matter how many times she got knocked down, she was gonna try and get back up, which is really Stephanie's story. Um, and when you know Stephanie, you kind of could sense that from her. And so it was a constant uh, tonal issue where we were always talking about in each scene, uh, you know, how earnest is the scene? How dramatic is the scene? What's the subtext of the scene? Uh, how do we play away from the obvious, uh, the obvious melodramatic tropes that would happen? Uh, and so uh, it was really just a daily conversation about how to do it. And, and frankly, Riley was a big part of that because she was always, the little kid was always laughing or running around or needed to get picked up and thrown around. And, you know, um, and that was part of what, uh, what kept the days kind of joyous. We had to maintain a fun atmosphere on the set, which then carried over into a lot of the other side. <clears throat> it took me a long time after the first two, and then I had to do it again when I directed the last two episodes. To, uh, you know, what I did with Riley always was she really, I had made the mistake early on of using a Donald Duck voice with her that I had used with my own children. And she loved it. And so she would have me do it all day long to the point where at the end of days, I could barely speak. So that's kind of my, most of my conversations with Riley were like, you know, that kind of thing all the time. You do that for like 12 hours. You don't have much, uh, you don't have much voice left. Um, and, you know, the, the perils of directing everyone, I'm sure can relate to a Donald Duck voice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Margaret uh, ended up uh, doing a thing called that's in the show. You'll see it a couple of times, which was Superbird, where she would put Riley on her shoulders and then and kind of spread her arms across. You'll see it in the show and then spin around. And, and Riley loved it so much that poor Margaret was doing it, you know, for hours a day. And Q Tran, our cinematographer, was swinging her around. So everybody was participating and all of that joy of being around a child, which Molly was really clear about in the writing that that um, the character that Alex would try and shield from her daughter of uh, the, the seriousness of the situations that were, they were in. And so, uh, you know, it carried through our trying to keep Riley involved in it with the quality of the writing um, and the joy that, of just having a child around all I think came through in the final, in the final product. And I can imagine having, uh, you know, a child at the, you know, at the center of that set also kind of 
reinforces the themes of how like Alex is doing everything in her power to keep this child safe and keep this child happy and and not aware of uh, of of the perils that they're sometimes in. Yeah, and, and that was a huge part of it. And, and the entire crew and all the rest of the cast, everybody was involved in that. Uh, in that, you know, it was really difficult for Nick Robinson, who who uh, you know played her father, um, Alex's uh, boyfriend, Sean, and it you know it it was really difficult for him because he couldn't be a nicer guy. And yet he was always having to, you know, be unpleasant around her or yell or whatever. <laughs> it was very difficult because, you know, he didn't want her to be frightened of her. Same with uh, Andy McDowell, who, you know, plays Paula. Uh, and, um, and some of the manic behavior that she had to do could get very frightening for the little girl. Uh, now you've had a, a, an incredibly successful career as a producer, a writer, director, uh, you know, going from everything from broadcast TV to, of course, a streamer like Netflix. Uh, How has it been adjusting to those changes, especially these last 10 years, uh, the way the industry has kind of completely transformed? A really extraordinary thing over the last years has been the, the ability for us to tell all different kinds of stories. Um, when I began my career, we were always having to go in and find ways to do character through existing formats. You know, you'd be pitching doctors or police officers or attorneys or whatever you were pitching. And then you wanted to do as much detailed and complicated character work as you could, but you were always having to do it through a, you know, a fairly limited number of, uh, of types of stories that you could tell. The last 10 years, we've just, it's opened up to the point where we can tell stories about all different kinds of people and experiences and I think the audience now is is attuned to wanting those things. And just as, as writers and storytellers, directors, we're able to bring in all different sorts of different types of uh, stories about different people's lives and experience and let the audience see things that they wouldn't normally see or be exposed to, which you'd never want to overstate the power of, of what we do in the culture. But you know, it, by getting a chance to see things and understand people's experiences that, you're, that aren't your own experience, we can influence uh, people's attitudes towards things they might be afraid of or not know about. And you know, being able to do shows that are as varied as the ones that are on now has, has really been a, a great luxury and, and one of the great joys of having this many different places to make, to tell stories. Uh, and from a production standpoint, is it does it feel more like you know, cinematic uh, process, uh, you know, more than what the, you know, the traditional uh, network TV process is? Well, it's, it's evolved over time. I mean, certainly it's much more cinematic than it was when we began, although certainly on shows like ER and West Wing, we were trying to be very cinematic. Um, it, it, truthfully, now you have to compete cinematically. The audience is not making a distinction between what they see in the theater and what they see on their large television at home. Um, and so the expectation for the quality of what you do, it's, I've directed films and, and I've directed a lot of television. There's no real difference in what we do on the set. Um, you know, and then sometimes you actually have more time in television because you don't have quite as many um, requirements for the kind of locations you're in. You can kind of set worlds in which you can move a little bit more quickly on, on television. Um, so I think that we're actually, you know, with the exception of kind of large, uh, cinematic enterprises, which you really should see in a theater. Um, and the quality of what we're able to do in it with these limited series, with television series now, we're really just competing with what you would go see in, in films 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and it's great because now you know, people who wouldn't have been working in television before, or, you know, actively working in television now, and it's raised all, you know, raising tide raises all boats. It's, it's brought everything up. Uh, and I had the opportunity to uh, talk to Molly yesterday, day before we're recording this. Um, and she mentioned that everyone should uh, have to study with John Wells uh, before running a show for the first time. Uh, you know, and with so much TV out there uh, nowadays, uh, is that something that's important to you? Kind of like sharing that experience and that uh, uh, expertise that you've developed over, over the years? Yeah, um, you know, I came up working underneath a number of really talented people who I admired who took a great deal of time with me to uh, tell me what they did well and mistakes they'd made. And, um, 
And I think that's part of what we have to do as, as we continue on in our careers. I mean, it's such a great pleasure to work with someone as talented as Molly and be able to, you know, share some of the things that I've learned that she wouldn't have had the experience time. You know, she hasn't had the experiences yet to allow her to do that and see her, you know, rise to that occasion so, uh, so magnificently. So, yeah, I do think that all of us who've done this for a while and have had some success, part of our responsibility is to make sure the young art artists that we get an opportunity to work with, we get to work and uh, with their tremendous, uh, you know, work with their skills, with their work. Um, and in exchange, we need to be showing them what we know. Uh, that's just the way it really has to work. And, and um, it's one of the great pleasures now at this point in my career to be able to spend time and uh, supporting and also being enriched by, you know, working with other artists who are as talented as Molly and Q Tran, who was the DP and Margaret and all the great people you, you work with. It, uh, we're all creating something together. And if part of my contributions are that I have some experience that's useful in that process, that's great. Um, but I get a lot from it at the same time. Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on MAID um, and all the excellent work that you're uh, constantly doing. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you about it. Thank you so much. It's nice to talk to you. Take care. Mm -hmm.